buddy. It's your boy, the Versace Thorn. We have a very special episode tonight on the VSW. We have a very great guest. The one, the only, Chris Silvio Esquire. Welcome. Thank you, my friend. I am uh, happy to be here, and I don't think I've ever seen such a charming man in a fur coat. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know, it's been cold this winter. It's been extra cold. So you got to stay warm. And you know what, man? Straight up, pimping ain't easy. What is it? I said pimping ain't easy. You know? No, it isn't. It's actually, it's not easy at all. And um, even harder than that is podcasting believe it or not. Podcasting is even harder than pimping. You know, I used to run my own podcast for a while, and that's actually the reason I stopped, because it's hard to tell. Um, but, you know, but you're still doing it, so I'm here on your show. I, you know why I do it? Because, you know, I started a podcast a long time, well, not a long time ago, a couple of years ago, um, pandemic era, we'll say, 2020, because I wanted guys and girls that were, you know, working these VFW Friday night shows and Saturday night shows in front of 40 to 100 people to have maybe 1,000 or 10,000 people on them. I never thought it would grow into what it grew into. I have a decent following, and I get a lot of eyes and ears on the scene. And and, and that's why I keep going, because it it does do what, you know, my mission was, get eyes and ears on the independent wrestling scene. And that's cool, man. Like, we need a lot more people like you out there advocating for, especially of the new and younger talent that really haven't had the stage yet or the exposure um, nationally for everyone to know who they are. Um, so I'm glad you provide something like that. Um, and as far as like getting where you are now, um, it probably is the coat. I got to say it's the coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, but, you know, um, you know, but oh. like I said, it has its challenges. And sometimes, this, you know, wrestling itself has its challenges. It has you know, it has a very dark side to wrestling. As if you watch it or you even are on Twitter, it has this whole other side that just spirals out of control with controversy and bullshit. It has negative fans on another side that just hate their own product. And, and that's just bizarre in its own mind. And then you have, you know, the typical kind of indie drama that can take place. So, you know, you throw all of this together, it becomes tiring. And, and it, it became like that, you know, in 2022, it became kind of, very chaotic time for me personally. And then coming into 2023, something kind of re-sparked, rekindled, refurbished that flame. And that was the Kill City Cup. I know a lot about that. Um, let me ask you, though, before we continue this, um, what's our rating here? Is this like PG, PG-13? What about our, my- our rating, like as far as language. Um, what kind of show is this? PG-13, rated R, PG, what are you looking for? What kind of show do I put on? Yeah, like what's our rating? Like can I say like the seven dirty words, etc.? Oh, 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 Um, you can put out whatever. I mean, it, it's a free. I'm about to smoke this joint right now. I am the Versace stoner. I like to smoke <laughs> cannabis. Um, You know, as long as there's no, you know, I don't, I don't tolerate racism. I don't tolerate hate speech. I don't tolerate any of that, but... You know, the floor's open. If you're dropping the F-bomb, you're dropping swears, it, it, it's part of human nature. Good. And I don't tolerate those things either. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, um, wrestling is an extremely hard business, especially when it's your career and you make it your grind. Um, like a lot of the fans don't that, that watch, um, some do, but others don't quite understand exactly what goes into all the traveling, the miles on our body. So, for example, I remember weekends traveling, like, between, like, a Thursday and a Monday, traveling, like, 4,000 miles, wrestling three or four matches in that time span, plus 4,000 miles on your back in the plane or in the car. Um, And it's a lot of shit. And you got to go out there and perform um, at a high level for all the fans. And uh, I can definitely relate, too, like how you were saying – you know, a, a lot of uh, fans today can tend to be negative about certain things. Kind of the way I always looked at it is like, I look at it like one of my favorite books. Like, I love wrestling. I lo- I've loved wrestling since I was a fucking infant. Um, and I look at it like one of my favorite bands put out an album. I may not like every uh, song on that album, 
but it doesn't mean that I feel the need to take to the rest of the world and be like, hey, track number three on this new album is the worst thing I've ever seen. F this label, F this band. And uh, well, some wrestling fans do that. I don't know why. Uh, thankfully, I have some cool fans that, you know, stuck with me since day one. Um, but it's weird, man. I get where you're coming from. I don't know why people do what they do, but I'm an Esquire and I'm not, um, you know, psychologist. So maybe not for me to determine that. Two, two totally different professions. I mean, unless they become criminally insane, then they might end up in the outdoor stuff. But um, let me ask you this. When did, when, can, you know, we're trying to, I'm kind of referencing, when did you break in? When did you start wrestling? What year frame? I started training in 2001. Okay, and so yeah, the internet was kind of flourishing then, and people had started. I mean, when I started watching wrestling, it was like 84, 85. I was a young kid, you know, I was flicking the channels. I happened to catch upon WrestleMania too, and I was just like, wow, this is really cool. And I saw the steel cage, and I was in love. And then, you know, over the years, I would catch it on and off. And then eventually, I'd become, you know, a big fan and be able to find some video stores and so forth. But at that point, no internet. No fan input at all. If you had a friend, you guys might talk about it and be like, oh, I don't, I hate that guy, I hate that guy. But there was nobody ever complaining. Like, I never remember as a kid watching a show and being like, oh my God, that match was terrible. Or like, oh my God, I wish I didn't order that pay per view. Like, we were always satisfied. We were always happy. We were always just, this is the best one ever, even if it was the worst. Like, I know looking back, people hate WrestleMania 9. They hate it with a passion, right? <laughs> But I was out there in Las Vegas, WrestleMania 9. I went there, okay, Caesar's Palace. Being there at 10 years old as a kid, you know, and it was a amazing outdoor arena, huge setup, something different. You know, it was different. It was a different time to being a kid. Looking back, yeah, sure, it's all goofy gimmicks and, you know, not the best wrestling. But at the time frame, it's like, yeah, this is awesome. So, okay, so you're coming in in 2001. I mean, WWE had just transitioned kind of, or they were transitioning out of that era of attitude and into the ruthless aggression, which, you know, a lot of people, I think, I think when that happened, I think it became more of a respectable kind of sport again. Like, for a while, I feel like wrestling was just, like, pulling anybody. They wanted celebs. They wanted porn stars. They, they didn't even care about athletes. They just wanted names. Crafty names at that. They didn't care. But if they drew controversy, they'd pull them. WCW, WWE, ECW, XPW. I mean, they were just grabbing anybody. Um, but then, you know, the ruthless aggression, it became more like, again, like a sport. And then it would, you know, obviously it would even evolve even further into that. So back then, though, how was it um, coming into it? I mean, I know now it's a lot changed. Was it a lot different, though? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, the internet being a, a huge difference. Um, you know, you didn't have platforms like YouTube and social media to share your shit and get your name out there. So I remember sending out like packets to promoters that had like a VHS tape, uh, eight by 10, a bio and a nice little sealed envelope and I'd mail it to people. And um, these were the days, nobody does this anymore. These were the days where you also called promoters. I remember <laughs> calling the offices of like, you know, TNA or WWEC in Puerto Rico, uh, be like, hey, I'm Chris. I've been around a few years. I'm pretty good at this stuff. How about I come work for you? Um, but that was the kind of stuff you had to do back then to get ahead. Yeah, um, you call a promoter now, you'll get the block button on the phone and then yeah. on the social media. Um, but okay. yeah, I mean, back then, yeah, you would have to call. You would be actually, sometimes you would meet people. Hey, we're going to meet up. You want to? I want to come meet you. I'm going to meet you at the gym or wherever show you're going to bat. Hey, I'll, I'll hang around afterwards. Let's talk. And that would be the first interaction. That would be the first point. Do you have Hardee's restaurants where you're at? It's like a hamburger joint. Yep. So one of my first regular bookings that I got around the time I started happened from me being at a Hardee's. I was at a Hardee's with my tag team partner I started with. And uh, we ran into this guy who we met somewhere. And uh, he was like, hey, we're uh, promoting like a bunch of shows in North Carolina. You guys want to wrestle? I was like, hell yeah. And so I, I scribbled down his phone number on a piece of paper. And to this day, I still have that phone number. And about once a year, I send it to my tag team partner, um, Jimmy Paradise, who's now one of the best producers in NXT, um, you know, just as a reminder of like where we started and how far we've come. 
That's how it was, man. And it was also a lot crazier uh, behind the scenes as well. Like today, it's it's very tamed in most places behind the scenes. So what was your um, what was your debut? What was your debut match? Where'd you work at first? Like where'd you get your first? Like hey, this is my match. Elizabeth City, North Carolina, uh, March twenty two thousand two. And it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. I remember I ordered like this sweet new gear. And of course it didn't arrive in time. So I had to solve it and find something. So I went to like my local, I, I grew up in a small town called Mechanicsville. So just that name alone, you know, there's not a lot of stuff. We had one sporting goods store and it was like a, a buy and sell used and new place. So I went and the only thing that I could find was a used thing. And it was like a youth extra small. Um, thank God I wasn't as jacked as I am today. Um, but I remember I bought like the youth extra small singlet and some sliding pads that resembled wrestling kick pads and wore my high school wrestling shoes. And my partner, Jimmy, had to pull me into the singlet top for our mat. But I made the shit work. And uh, a few months later, my gear came and you know, we're off the road. And it's off for history. And I mean, I mean, sometimes you do that. You have to just improvise kind of because things just, well, how do you think I think ever go as planned, especially in wrestling? There's always something that just pops up. I slept in a dirty van that too, on the floor of a dirty van. Yeah. Um, so we um, were working down North Carolina and um, out in that territory. Did you stay down there for a while? Did you start to venture out? Yeah, man. Um, so I, I, I started. Uh, in that area and started promoting um, shows myself with some friends under uh, Richmond Lucha Libre. And um, we were kind of like GCW before GCW. Like we were doing a lot of the hardcore shit and very gimmicky acts. Um, and we would do like bar and club shows that would outdraw. Like I remember at one point we were outdrawing the minor league baseball team in Richmond. That was a pretty popular attraction. Um, you know, we were doing well, like sponsored by Jim Beam and Camel Cigarettes. We were like an alternative form of entertainment. Um, so like I, I kind of got my chops doing those shows and around uh, the Carolinas in Virginia. And then, um, you know, one day I'm like, I was still a kid, man. I was probably 22. I'm like, this is fun, but I want to do more. I want to, I want to make some money at this. Like, this is what I want to do with my life. I'd, um, I've been cooking since I was a kid. Like, I have, uh, several brothers and, you know, my parents work. So, like, from a young age, we would learn to cook for ourselves. And, uh, so when I, you know, became 18, I always worked in restaurants as, uh, wine cooks, sous chef, stuff like that. And I was like, man, I'm really tired of cooking all the fucking time and, uh, you know, having to ask for time off to wrestle. And like when you when you work in a restaurant and you're like a sous chef, they want you working 50, 60 hours a week. Oh it, yeah, it's intense. Restaurant business is not like you want to talk about something that's not easy on the real. It's the restaurant business. It's insane yeah. hours. Is a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. It's tough. Trying to balance that and a burgeoning wrestling career. Um, so I just I had to make a choice, um, and I went to a tryout at uh, at OVW in 2007 in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, thankfully, I got accepted into the training program there. And it was the best decision I ever made. Um, I knew how to wrestle before I went there. But when I got there, I learned how to work. And uh, I learned the business end of professional wrestling throughout my time there. <coughs> that allowed me to go on to do, you know, all kinds of TV work, travel overseas, um, you know, make a name for myself as a wrestler, a coach and now a producer in the industry. Um, and I just, I have to credit them because my coach, Rip Rogers, uh, really just kind of opened my eyes, man. He was like a, a, a guru or like a yogi or, you know, mystic shaman, but in like a very vulgar and in your face kind of way. Um, just kind of opened my eyes to, holy shit, I thought I was really, really good before I got here. He helped me realize like, you don't know shit about shit right now, kid. You got a lot more to learn. And that's really when I could, when I could soak in all the knowledge and figure out how to actually work, uh, which is a lot different to wrestling. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, let's, I mean, if you want to really be tagging on Brady down, anybody can almost just, you know, learn how to kind of wrestle. You can get in there, you can punch each other, you can slap each other, you can, you know, brawl. But that's not really working. You're not working your crowd. You're not working a match. You're not doing the, you know, the, the psych, psychological work of what goes into actual wrestling. And it is. It's, it's half physical, yes. And all those stunts are great. But if it doesn't make sense why you're doing them, then, you know, you're just going to end up on somebody's Twitter feed and someone else is getting rich off of it. Um, you know, um, but I'm glad, you know, that you make that distinction because there is that distinction. A lot of people don't think that I'm a wrestler, I'm a wrestler. Yes, yes, but are you doing it effectively? Are you effectively working the crowd? Are you effectively working your gimmick? Are you effectively being the best wrestler that you can possibly be as far as the whole thing? Not just, you know, my two great spots that I can do in front of, you know, my fans. I, there's more to it, like you said. And that's so, so you'll say that's where you really grab that foundation. And now, you know, this is what made you, with, you know, what you are today. That's what gave me my stripes, man. I could do any move in the world when I got there, but I learned how to work. Like I'm sitting right here now at my uh, training center, Death Proof Dojo, and um, you know when I when I train my talent to come through here, I try to share a lot of the lessons that I learned. Like I can take a good athlete who's coaching, and I can show them a lot of good wrestling techniques, and they might be able to do it extremely well, but that's not the be all end all. If you cannot connect with the audience, if you cannot get them emotionally invested in you, your angle, your match, um, you're not going to draw money for the company. Um, there's all these things that go into it. If, if you don't understand how to tell a physical story, like we don't, as wrestlers, yes, we have our promos, but once the bell rings, we're making a movie, man. We're telling a story with zero dialogue. So if you don't know how to tell that story, Physically, with your body, your facial expressions, it's going to be really hard to connect, and it's going to be even harder to get to higher levels of the business. Um, and again, that's why I'm so thankful for my background um, that I was able to pick up those lessons. And you know, I've, I've worked with pretty much every good company there is. Um, and it's just you have to learn what this profession is all about. It is a sport, and I will always say that. Uh, but just as much, it's it's a drama. Um, you know, my goal when I have a match is I want to make people cry or I want to make people so angry that they throw beer bottles at them. Or I want to make them so happy that when the bell rings, they literally jump from their chair. Like, this was my moment. I can't believe that happened. Um, and you just, you really have to uh, study under the greats and, um, you know, learn your craft to be able to do that. Let me ask you now, as you, know, you said, you're training people. How important would you say, you know, um, you know, it's great to be a solid wrestler. It's great to have that appearance of physique and all that. How important would you say, like, mic work is and being able to, you know, actually deliver a good promo? That is, you know, I see a lot of guys that can wrestle great and they can't speak. It's my pet peeve in general, but I just kind of like to see trainers takes on it. Yep. It's, it's up there, man. Um, I use a similar scale to uh, Bret Hart. He talked about this in some interviews. I look at it like you got three areas. Uh, one, you got your look. Um, that means your body, your gear. Do you look marketable? Do you look presentable? Two is your work in the ring. Can you convincingly wrestle? Can you convincingly show the audience that you are trying to hurt this other human being and make it both entertaining and realistic at the same time? And then third is, can you talk? Um, you know, the perfect wrestler has all of those three things. Sometimes you can get away with two of the three. You will never succeed with one of them. Uh, but in, in my opinion, um, I would put promos up there, like right behind your ability to work in the ring, um, because that's how you draw money. That's how you sell tickets. Promos are my currently my favorite thing in the world to do. Like... Um, Thankfully, right now at, at NWA, I've, I've had the opportunity to really kind of branch out and experiment with different things in my promos. And uh, Billy Corgan gives me kind of the freedom to tell my stories and say what I want. And I've taken full advantage of that. And, um, you know, now my promos are really on another level 
not that they weren't, um, you know, good before, but they're on another level now. Um, so yes, I think, uh, if you're in this profession, you have to, um, develop to get the gab. And I was an introvert, man. I was a shy kid. I started in this business at 17. So I know what it's like to not, I remember those days being on a show and getting a live mic put in my hand and wanting to shit my pants and just winging it and trying to get through it. Um, but I developed those skills over the years. And to any like aspiring wrestlers listening right now, develop those skills. Practice your promos every single day at home. Um, I, I started in 01. There's not a day that goes by that I do not work on promos in some capacity or work on some kind of wrestling technique. And if you want to be great and learn this and make it your career, um, best advice I could give you is that. Um, work on it every single day. Does that answer your question, Tokyo? Oh, yes, definitely. You know, and, um, you know, and I only, like I said, it, it's a pet peeve of mine just because I grew up in such a, I would say, promo heavy era, and that's the 80s, early 90s. I mean, you had guys that were like Macho Man that were just all around fabulous, Mike Worker, wrestle. Then you had people like Hogan who really actually, looking back, couldn't wrestle that good, but would, as a kid, draw you in with that promo. And, you know, having that before match interview, having that after match interview, those were all like pinnacle parts of wrestling for me growing up because that's what kept the story, as you said, going from, you know, the ring, outside the ring to the next week's show or the next month's show, even, or, you know, the three month later pay per view. It was all through just, you know, those little blips and blurbs of stories. Um, and like I said, it's sad to see. And I, and I can say the same thing, you know, shyness, I was a shy kid as well. And, you know, it's not easy to talk, it's not easy to talk to. Sometimes you get caught up, and it's okay to to make mistakes. It doesn't have to always yeah. be perfect, you know. Um, unless I mean, obviously, you're working for some big movie producer. But even then, if you ever watch it, there's hundreds of outtakes. Why do you think that? Because even professionals make mistakes, and sometimes mistakes are good, and they get left in. Um, I'm a big cinema buff myself, like. Uh, Martin Scorsese is my favorite director. Um, I'm really into Oliver Stone, Tarantino. I study film yep. almost as much as wrestling. And just, you know, while educating myself in that area, there's a lot of things that are improv. Like I think back on like Marlon Brando or Robert De Niro, where they threw things in that were not supposed to be there or messed something up, and it actually made the scene. And I kind of look yeah. at wrestling scripture. Like um, in, a, in a match, um, if everything goes too smoothly, something's up, right? Like you're looking at the match and you're like, okay, these two are kind of playing grab ass with each other. They it's too clean. Them. Too clean. Right? No. Um, just to revert, because you mentioned movie buffs, because says I'm actually a big kind of movie buff too, especially that general area. Um, you know, that famous Pesci scene was mostly improv, you know, where he's like, you think I'm funny, funny, how? That, that was all kind of just improv on the fly. Um, and it's one of the most famous movie scenes across the, you know, the world. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, definitely, though. Um, you know, sometimes on the wrestling, it is, you know, you have to kind of just roll with it. Even in wrestling, you'll hear them say, like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. I wasn't going to ever do that. And it worked. Yep. And, and it's the same in promos. I remember um, fairly recently, I did one uh, particular promo for NWA. I, I can't remember the story. But um, there was a point where, like, I flubbed the word. I don't know, maybe I was trying to say like invincible and I said irresistible or something. And um, when I finished it, like it felt really good other than that. And um, Corbin's like, great, keep it. And I go, yeah, but didn't you hear my line earlier? Like it sounded kind of weird. He's like, no, that's perfect. Like not everything is going to come out the way that you intend it to. It's human nature, it's natural. Um, so it's the same in the ring. Like, you know, if, if something goes a little squirrely or something looks a little rough, promos are the same way. Like, uh, I think a lot of guys try to keep their promos a bit too clean and unrealistic, um, as opposed to talking like a human being. And if they fuck up a word or something, just roll with it because that's what yeah. humans do. If you and I are at a bar eating wings, we might say something incorrectly. We'll correct ourselves and then on about the conversation. It's human nature. Hey, not for nothing. Even Booker T rolled with it. 
You know, he said what he said, but he just kept going. He didn't stop and say, oh, shit, you know, oh, my God. Like, he just went with it. He did what he had to do, and it kept on going. I mean, that's kind of that whole the show must go on mentality, and it might happen. And, you know, maybe people remember, or maybe people will forget, you know. But there is that thing when it looks too clean, and you got those fans going, well, this is overly choreographed, you know. Who, you know, this is like you're watching the dance freestyle. This is ridiculous. This is ballerina work. Um, you know, that realism kind of gets dissipated when, you know, it looks too clean. Because you want it to look a little choppy. You want it to look like a little bit of a, a fight. I mean, it's wrestling. Exactly. I've, I've got a pretty good uh, story for you. Um, a happy accident. Um, this would have been, man, a while ago. Let's say 2009. And I had just gotten a pair of uh, wrestling boots from Puerto Rico. And I'd never used this company before, but, you know, there was, I got a decent deal on them. I wasn't making a lot of money at the time, so I took the best deal I could. And they were good. So I put them on, and it's my first match wearing the boots. And I get uh, Bandera out of the corner and onto the apron. So if, if you're not familiar with that term, basically you're running at somebody in the turnbuckle to deliver a, a clothesline or something, and they kind of like backdrop you and you land on the apron. Well, when that happened, I landed on the apron, and the sole on my uh, brand new Puerto Rican wrestling boot blew out like a tire on the highway. And I fell off of the apron. And when I fell and heard the thud on the gym floor, because you know, of course they don't put mats out, um, I heard the crowd. And the crowd kind of went, huh. And that told me something. I was like, okay, I'm just going to lay there. So the longer I laid there, the more I felt the crowd starting to stand up and like it was still quiet and they're peeking over looking at me like, oh no, this isn't part of the show. Something happened. And I could just feel the energy starting to to pick up. Uh, there was real emotion, real energy. So I um I take my damn boot off and I throw it and I hop into the ring on one foot. And get back in, and immediately the guy goes to work on me, starts like beating the hell out of my leg. And for the rest of the match, the crowd is just so behind me, like, "Come on, man, you can do this. You can overcome these odds." Um, but it was just that happy accident of that happened, and I listened to that. And but that's being so aware, you know. That's being in tune of what's going on, and that's working on the fly. You imagine, you know, had it been, you know, said a certain way, and you were set in your way, you would have just done it however, uh, got right up, went in, and it wouldn't have had that moment. So being able you know, to kind of adapt it, that's amazing, and that's an that's awesome story. I mean, that's what so, a does, man. so you were working in that area, and um, I'm guessing you started working because you said now you're in the NWA. Um. How was the journey from, you know, A to B? How did that happen? Like just You just kept working and grinding, get noticed? Started at OVW, um, really, when I started picking up a lot of steam. Um, and once I, like, feel I got pretty damn good for the time um, at OVW and got a better physique, my promos were more on point, um, I started getting more high-profile high indie bookings um, and that led to working with Ring of Honor for uh, roughly two years. And that was like my first kind of big national break um, here in America. And uh, thank you, Jim Cornette, for that one. Um, he was one of the only guys in my early career that flat out pushed for me. Like they say in wrestling, it, um, it doesn't really matter who you know. It matters who you want to say they know you. And um, Cornette. I was a cornet hire, and um, I was really thankful for that experience of getting on national TV, getting my name out there. Um, you know, and it only helped my profile. So, working on Ring of Honor and OVW. Well, at least it helped too. Like it didn't help you know, train wreck when they said, "Well, I know him. He's a good wrestler." Send him in with New Jack. That's when it gets to the dark side of, "Hey, I don't want to know anybody." <laughs> yeah, we don't, but, we don't want um, to play. Good. But yeah, you know, um, so. You know, that's awesome, though. And, you know, Ring of Honor, you know, I feel like it's very underrated. I feel like it gets underrated because people don't know how to watch it. Like, it's not on a TV channel, so people just automatically assume it's, you know, behind a paywall or maybe it isn't or how do I subscribe. And I feel like it gets lost in the shuffle. But they read the headlines, they order the pay-per-views, but, like, the weekly gets lost. Same thing happened with Impact, I feel, and same thing happened with a lot of them just because they don't have that platform. Now, I mean, luckily... 
things are starting to get it so people are able to watch more wrestling more than ever. You know, there's so many outlets now. But yeah. um, so during that Ring of Honor time, what would you say would be your like, most memorable match you had? Uh, Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. Um, we got myself and my tag team partner. Um, that's totally awesome. That was our tag team name. We got to be like, uh, I guess co-main events would be the appropriate term. Um, and we wrestled a tag team from our area called A1. And um, what was really cool is that Richmond is my city. And um, like it's a little emotional talking about it, but the whole fucking city turned out for us that night. Like, it was the boys coming back home. Like We'd been living in Louisville, grinding, working for OBW. Started doing the TVs with ROH, house shows, grinding, and now we were coming back home. Um, so I remember like my small town newspaper covered it. Um, the Richmond uh, NBC station came out to the arena to cover me on the news. And I was getting a lot of dirty looks from some of the boys backstage because I was one of the younger talents. And uh, but man, I was I was a hometown guy, and um, my city came out and showed support, and uh, it was just. It's one of those surreal moments where you just you pack this place out and you know that a lot of these people came to see the show, but more importantly, they came to see you. So it's kind of our opportunity to show the company like... Hey, in a small you. sense, I mean, you kind of made it. It's like, oh, this is why I kind of did it. You know, here I am. I'm that but star on, that I thought I could be. Yes, but on a business sense, it was our opportunity to show the company, hey, we can draw you guys money. Um, and that was, uh, you know, what we did that night. We drew a hell of a lot of fucking money for that company, and everybody busted their ass and put on a great show. Um, you know, it, it wasn't. You know, I, I tell you, it's funny you said that because I was reading something today. I don't know if it was a meme. I don't even know who posted it, but it said something about to the extent of, you know, that the promoters shouldn't kind of overlook the new guy and kind of, you know. Because the new people that come in, when they get that local show, they end up bringing in a decent amount of people. All their friends want to see their first match, right? So when they start selling, you know, half the crowd out, you might want to give them more of a role to kind of bait the crowd to come back the next time. You know, don't just use them and never use them again. Kind of work with that. See who's drawing, even if they're new. They don't might not be the best talent you have, but the the, the highest drawer, you know. Um, but yeah. Um, that is a surreal moment, though, getting to, you know, be in front of, you know, people that you kind of grew up with, may, may have even known you from the neighborhood as a youngster, being like, oh, wow, he made it, he did it, he's doing it. They did, man. And um, another funny part about that, like I said, we were two of the younger talents there trying not to step on toes, trying to get ourselves over. Uh, we had television in Baltimore, Maryland, the day after the show. And we have a meeting in the locker room before the show. I don't think I've ever told this story on a podcast, so this is the first for you. Um, at this meeting in the locker room, Jim Cornette says, uh, you know, last night, uh, Silvio and uh, Paradise, they sold X amount of tickets. We should have put the goddamn tag team titles on them. What did the rest of you guys draw? And, uh, you know, this is a lesson for you guys to see out there hustling and blah, blah, blah. And when he said that, I just remember sinking into my chair. And like looking around, and you just feel all the eyes. And I'm like, fuck, what am I gonna do? Like, thankfully, I'm cool and I'm a good brother backstage. So I just continue to be me and be like, I just want to say that. Like, you're cool. Let's have a beer after the show. Uh, but yeah, he said that in front of everyone. And on our way there, we, we stopped at a gas station on the way to Maryland for uh, the taping. And um, it was in D.C., I believe. And we walk in, and I'm like, hey, dude, uh, where's your back? And he's like, you don't have one. Go, okay. Um, and he goes, just uh, go around the back behind the dumpster. He says, what do you mean go around the back behind the dumpster? Go around back behind the dumpster. He's like, man, I've been in the car for three hours. I really got to pee. So myself and my tag partner were like, looking at each other, and we're like, fuck it, let's go. <laughs> so we go around the back. And like we kind of flank it like this way. I go left, he goes right. And as we're going to the back of the dumpster, there's a uh, homeless man, I guess would be the best way to put it, back there taking a dump. 
um, right there behind the dumpster. So I guess everyone but us knew that's where the bathroom was in DC for that last I held my pistol we got to Baltimore, but I can't say the same about myself. <laughs> How's that for a puck? <laughs> oh boy. But that's the wrestling business. It's not easy, right? Not easy. You gotta hold your piss sometimes for three and a half hours. Sometimes you gotta do it. I mean, what do you do during the match if you have to go? I mean, it had to come up during a match where you've had to gone at some point, right? Well, I'll educate you on something. Every pro wrestler in the world will probably tell you this. There is something, no matter how much liquid is or is not in your body, before your match, you must piss. Like, something in your body says, I have to pee now. And every single wrestler does this. So before their match, they'll go pee and come back up. I just, I've always gone against the grain. So this started somewhere around 10 years ago, and I'm a psychopath, I can admit it. Um, when I would get that feeling, I would look at it as mind over matter, and I'd be like, I'm not going to pee. I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to let that go. Me. That's nerves or something. I'm just going to go in and have my match. So I don't piss before a match is but <laughs> every wrestler, like, ask the next wrestler on your show, do they pee before their match? Well, I can just imagine. I mean, not, I mean, if you're like doping some energy drinks and shit, all of a sudden, you know, you're in the match and you're pounding your stomach and your blood is getting whacked. I mean, I can see it being an issue, but yeah, I mean, but I mean, some of those, you know, some, I mean, I remember watching like you know, Iron Man matches for an hour and thinking, you know, poor guys are just waiting for this thing to end. <laughs> Especially if you do have those nerves, you know, not, you know, you get all sorts of gastric issues going on in a match. Um, and, you know, some guys even, you know, have nothing, but people will work sick. People will work through it. People will be tough and actually, you know, go get through it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, let me ask you, how was, I mean, because, you know, I think he's a, a youth. Yeah, found a knowledge, and a lot of people don't like his opinions, but how was working with Cornette? Incredible. Um, I think what I picked up most from Cornette was uh, finishes for matches. So I, I always just like watching him. Anyone I've ever worked under, like producers, I've always just studied them because I'm a student of the game. And I would just watch him going around, and I'd see him going his mental roller deck, the gear turning. And he'd just spit out, he'd be like, hey, we did this finish one time in uh, Mid-South in 84, where blah, 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 okay, here's your finish. And they would all be completely different. So what I tried to do was, like, every time he gave me a finish for my match, absorb it so I could use it for later or give it to someone else when I finish. Um, and, and outside of that, man, like, uh, the other thing I got from him the most was he was really a genuine caring guy that wanted to see wrestlers succeed. Um, people in ROH weren't making a lot of money. And I sure as hell was. And I remember at times, um, you know, Jimmy coming out of his own pocket and giving me an extra 50 bucks or 75 bucks or something like that. And he didn't have to do that. Um, and not a lot of guys would do those kind of things for no, but that's kind of that old school mentality because, you know, territorial days were like, that. hey, you're a drawer. You're someone that's going to get us more money in the long run. Let's take care of you. And that's kind of how the old school was. It wasn't really about, you know, what it is today. Um, it was more of kind of an organized business where people were together to say, hey, you know, the fans are the fans. We're the wrestlers. We're going to make money. This is how it's going to work. And, you know, they would want it. This guy's out selling. Hey, you did a great job tonight. You brought in X amount. They want to make sure you keep doing that, that you're not, you know, and to do that would be through money. Um, but, you know, I mean, like I said, not a lot of people are fans because he's kind of outspoken. Like, again, I said, I think he's a fan of knowledge. He's been around. He's been in a lot of different promotions. He, you know, originally in NWA. He's been in WWE, back in NWA. He's been, you know, everywhere. Um, he knows wrestling inside out. Um, but, you know, to touch on another thing, we talked about it very early on. Um, you said you worked with them. Kill City Cup. Tell me about that. Um, one of my favorite films, by the way, you know, like I said, it rejuvenated my passion for pro wrestling when it was at a stale point because I saw something that was very different. I had seen cinematic wrestling during the pandemic, and I was very intrigued. A lot of it, you know, WWE did a few matches that were really interesting. 
And a few indie promotions started to put on shows that were very interesting. Things were done differently. I remember one that was to um, no commentary, just classical music. It was very nice. But, you know, Kill City was even done more. It was cinematic. It was wrestlers playing characters. It, it was something on another level. And kind of like part slasher film, too. Um, it was cool, man. Like, um, I'm sure you know Luke, the director. Um, he's, a, he's a buddy of mine. And um, I didn't know much. He, Luke, if you know Luke, his brain is going in so many different ways. But he has so much creativity going on in there. So he's kind of telling me, like, a, a little bit about what we're going to do and some ideas. Um, but it was like just kind of a bunch of thoughts floating in the ether. And I'm like, well, this sounds cool, but I'm not sure, like, how it's going to turn out or how we're going to put this damn thing together. Um, and then um, kind of on late notice, I agreed to come in and help as a producer uh, to produce some of the matches, some of the scene stunts stuff like that and um when i got there like i just remember like talking to luke like you know what's your vision what do you want and it was just these awesomely creative cool ideas and he just needed a few people to help him to take these great ideas in his head and say this one goes here this one goes here this one goes here and um the whole thing was his vision and it turned out better than frankly i, I ever expected um, I've worked on some independent films and stuff, and it's a crapshoot, man. Like, you don't know how it's going to turn out. It might be awesome. It might be the worst thing ever. But um, I was really proud of uh, the production and him in particular uh, because that was, like, one of his dreams, man. Like, he made his vision come to life, and he promoted the hell out of it, and I got so much respect for him over that. But it was a, it was a crazy environment. It was a crazy shooting day. It was long. What I heard. Cats, you know, wrestlers get tired and it was hot, and, you know, there may have been a lot of smoke in there, and a couple of people didn't like smoke, so I had to handle that shit. And, uh, you know, the but you said um, you, you produced a match. Um, how was that? Because I feel like producing a match for something that would be cinematic or a movie, it's different than producing a match for a live audience. It has to be snappier. It has to be more attentive. It can't be this long, drawn thing. But it has to still have wrestling involved. How is that working? That into all that? I'd say really the only main difference is cuts. Um, and, and I don't recall us using that many cuts, but we had that option. So like if uh, they weren't doing something or a move or a spot or an emotional interaction the way that um, Luke wanted it and that, you know, we felt it should happen in the scene, we could stop, hey, try it like this. Um, but otherwise, like, I, I produced it very similarly to how I would produce a television match, you know, at NWA or, you know, OVW or anywhere else that I've that I've been produced matches at. Um, just the, the ability to cut, um, I think, is really the main thing. Yes, it was produced for, you know, TV quality, but, you know, it did something that, you know, is, isn't really done. Um, and that's get a full show into like about an hour of wrestling. And it was good wrestling. It was good matches. That's what I'm saying. Like, it was done in a special way because of that. Because, you know, if you watch a regular show, they're usually maybe two hours in these shows, two and a half, WWE, three hours plus. But this was everything, a whole story told, all of it together with decent matches, good wrestling. All within like an hour's time frame. Yeah, and that's uh, that was by design. Um, Luke didn't want it to be super long, and we share the same things about promoting shows. He promotes shows. I promoted a bunch of shows. We both share like the hour and a half, two hour philosophy, including intermission. You don't want people sitting around for three hours. Give them something cool and compact, and they're going to love it and come back. So yeah, I exactly. I mean, I, I knew after that one hour, I was like, okay, let me talk to Luke. Is there going to be a sequel was my first thought? Because it was it was just enough to satisfy me. It was also enough to want more. Mm -hmm. And the way he described it to me was uh, Mortal Kombat meets pro wrestling. And I kind of got the vibe. I was like, all right, I see, I see what you're, you know, I pick up what you're putting down. But once everything came together, I was like, holy shit, that's exactly what this film was. It was 
Mortal Kombat. What did you, what did you think when you started seeing people come in like Natalia and Brian K, Jimmy Jacobs, and names and people? What do you like? You know, you were like kind of like, oh wow, he really is doing it. Yeah, um, I was like, damn, he's investing in this film. That's cool. Like all the people you mentioned were, you know, coworkers or peers at some point, you know, throughout uh, my wrestling career. Um, but yeah, like when I saw, you know, the kind of talent and Matt Seidel was in it, um, the kind of talent he was bringing in, I know that that's, uh, you know, that's, well, that's dedication. It's showing dedication. It's, it's not an investment. a bunch of like local friends. It's using, you know, known yeah. friends. It's using people with, you know, that might have already been in IMBD. They've already been televised wrestlers. That's what I mean. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a nice cast. It's not just, you know, a thrown together cast of a bunch of boys backyard. Um, most everybody on that show is notable or been notable or have had a notable match or, you know, are somewhere right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you had to pick somebody, who would you say was your favorite character on that show? Markova, hands down. Was it? Italian Marco And Queen Gia. Gia and I are good friends, so maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, Markova was... What did you great. think of her getting screwed over, though, you know, by, by Gia and, you know, Mr. Kill? Mr. Kill's an ass, you know. That's that's what he does. He's a dick, so you you, you can't put things past him, man. He'll you got to watch that guy. He'll he'll snake you out of some shit if you let him. So, is there a rumor of a second film? I don't know. I've I'll just say this: I have um, made it clear that should such a thing come about, I'm on board for the project. Um, but that's at this point, that's all I know. So, so I you hope would so. be willing to help produce or produce the second film if it was available or being let out. That's good to know though, because you did do a great job at the first. I have to admit, like I said, it rejuvenated me to want to do podcast again, go to wrestling again. It, it just opened up a whole thing because of all that creativity that was in there, because of all Luke's creativity that sits there, and it that's is a lot of creativity. Is. And all that's the all avenues that goes. You know, I was thinking when I first watched. What was this one's backstory? What was that one's backstory? Me, I'm a big Zimmop fan. What's his backstory? You know, the dude has a zipper across the face. Um, the, the, the amount of work that went into the characters was just fun and entertaining. It was it was a lot of fun to watch. Being you know on the fan side, definitely just watching it was just like wow, this is this is great. You know, first I watched it as you know a wrestling fan, and then I watched it as a movie fan. And you know, it's kind of a little bit different because I watched it as a film with the plot with fighting scenes rather than, you know, a wrestling film telling the story. It's a little bit of a difference in my opinion. But either which way, it was excellently done. Either which way, if you came in watching, hey, I got this great action movie where this deathmatch tournament takes place, watch it. Awesome. Hey, I got this great indie show that has, you know, this cool Mortal Kombat vibe. Check it out. That works too. They both work. Yep. Um, you know, and that's one of the impressive things about that project. Yeah, man. And all those crazy characters you're talking about, like Zip Monk, that's all Luke. That's all the thing. Like I told you about his brain. Um, he's got all these creative ideas in there. All of those came from him. And I just remember like him showing me a notebook, I believe, like that said like Zip Monk. And then it had like a synopsis of who he is and what he does. And then this character. And I'm like, okay, yeah. So like Luke was the create. That was 100% his vision. I would say like the best contributions I gave to that film was like more on the logistics end, like uh, putting some scenes together, producing and just organizing and, you know, making sure people didn't die. But uh, the creative, I, I can't take any credit for that. That's 100% Luke. Great, great. And let me just ask you one final question. Where can folks find you now? Um, where can they check you out? Where can they catch you? Man, I don't know if I want people trying to find me. Uh, Are they tracking your jet like Taylor Swift? Bro, you have no idea. It's hard out here for a player in Tampa, bro. Um, yeah, but no. Uh, it <laughs> might be in GTA 6. You better watch out. They might be using your likeness. They might. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, where you can find me, um, next place you can find me in Orlando is going to be on February 24th. I will be um, at LFC. I am um, the head trainer of uh, LFC's Florida branch, Lingerie Fight Championships. And I will be a coach during the uh, live taping of uh, some of the female fighters on the show. 
and uh, that's going to be really cool. But the uh, the big news, um, even bigger, is uh, I will be in Dothan, Alabama on March 2nd for our annual event at NWA Hard Times. Um, oh. Yep, signature live event. I've done um, two Hard Times. This will be my third. And they've all been really special and big events. So I'm sure that this one is going to be just as cool. So people that are anywhere near the area, um, please get a ticket, come out to see it. Um, and you'll be able to see the matches, man, along with the other fans on the CW app, uh, CW network, any, any streaming platform where CW is available, you'll be able to see it, the matches later on there. Um, cause we'll be taping a bunch of like, uh, power episodes. Hey, you never know. I'm known to travel very far for wrestling. So maybe you'll see me out there at an NWU. A show someday. Hit me up. Later. But cool. um but yeah, that's great. Um and especially like I said, now you know with that CW app, you are able to get that audience to be able to follow along. Yep. And it's a big deal, man. Like um we got the big thing in in, in Dothan that'll be covered on a bunch of powers, you know, on CW. But um we also have a an unscripted show in the works um that I had the pleasure of working on. And it's not like a cheesy or phony type of thing that was like the main thing that was told to us like when this unscripted show came about and we had all these cameras following us backstage we were given specific instructions if you try to working or you start being fake you're off the thing so like we just had to be authentic and be our real selves and tell our real stories and um you'll get a chance to see me soon telling my real story which we don't have time to get into today but um, it's a roller coaster ride, man. But it's it's my life, and I'm proud of it. And um, that show is going to be coming out soon um, on CW as well. So I, I encourage everybody to check that out when it comes in. It's it's going to be really good TV, plus wrestling. Um, and then we have our signature power ep episode. Um, we also got a steel cage in Dothan. This is uh, the first steel cage match we've had in several years. I I want to say three to four years. So I'm excited about this. Um, I hope it's like the really tall cage like that they had um, in like later Crockett era. Not the yep. eight foot one, but like the 12 foot one. Because um, that'd be pretty badass. And maybe I can jump off the top of it or something. But it's going to be awesome. NWALiveEvents.com if you want to grab tickets to that show. Uh, any, uh, I'll give you even one more incentive. If you listen to this show and you arrive in Dothan, Alabama on March 2nd for hard times. I'll be out there for meet and greets and stuff like that. I'll give you a free eight by 10. I will sign it. I'll take a selfie with you. I might flick you off in the selfie. I might hug you. I don't know. But if you come to the show based on this plug tonight, um, I'll show you some love for coming out. And uh, maybe, you know, you can even buy me a beer after the show. I do like beer. You heard it there, folks. Go out, get out, get your tickets now. Check it out. Get over to the booth. Tell them a code word, maybe code word VSW. Make it easy. Something easy to code word VSW. And you know, like I said, just keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing great stuff. You know, teaching wrestling. It's very important stuff. And I thank you for coming on my show. Thank you very much. Yes, follow me at the Chris Silvio on all social media platforms and at death proof dojo on instagram and facebook if you want to train to become the next wrestling superstar and badass this is the place to do it uh thank you brother for having me it's been a pleasure talking to you man thank you and thank you everyone at home it's been a pleasure and as always support indie wrestling versace stoner out the following is brought to you by the Streaming now on YouTube. Scan the QR code to watch for free. Welcome to the Kill City Cup.